Good morning everyone and in this lecture we are going to discuss diarrhea and constipation and the diseases which are related with diarrhea and constipation. So uh, to start the lecture we are going to start the lecture with diarrhea. Now what is diarrhea? Like again different you will find a lot of definitions about diarrhea uh, but like uh, none of the application uh, you can say or uh, definitions are absolute rather different definitions are written in different books okay so um, simply you can say diarrhea varies with diet and age okay so um, simply like in infants you know the definition is different and in adults definition is different but a simple way to define diarrhea is like an increase in um, frequency um, or decreased, uh, you can say and or and decreased or or decreased, right? So both of the things. Um, consistency of stools compared to normal so uh, of course like uh, everyone have different normal things someone go like three times every day someone goes one time each day so things like this and of course like um, that's why you know uh, it's hard to def uh, describe diarrhea so in infants you know whenever there is any increase in the stool frequency to twice as often per day like in uh, older children uh, most of the time you know they go like once every day so when they have like more than three stools every day or what three stools are there so we call that the baby have diarrhea and simply uh, the diarrhea causes can be uh, can be the diarrhea can be acute like when it is less than two weeks or it could be chronic when it is more than two weeks okay so uh, this thing and as like uh, because i'm sure like yes on the first time you are going to study diarrhea uh, but simply um, there could be different causes of diarrhea like osmotic causes uh, okay before osmotic sorry again the most important thing is infectious causes right um, as well as osmotic causes osmotic causes are what like when there is some non-absorbable solutes in the GIT like lactose intolerance when the lactose is not absorbed so of course you they, they started losing it in the stools and uh, that is one of the thing or it could be secretory uh, type of diarrhea for example um, what happens uh, in cholera like you know there is more and more secretion going on in the GIT and that's why they have diarrhea or it could be malabsorption like celiac disease uh, malabsorption so like celiac disease uh, like when the GIT cannot absorb the thing so of course or the short bowel syndrome there are many examples for this thing so simply guys like as I always talk about like uh, whenever anyone presents with diarrhea we go for the history, we go for the physical examination, we go for the investigations. The approach for all these conditions are the same. So, of course, like in the history, you will found about the, you will inquire about the, when it started, either it's cute, either it's chronic, what is the consistency, what is the color, either it, there is blood, either there is mucus, um, how much is the duration and what is the quality, either there is, there is any associated symptoms like fever, abdominal pain and either there is any recent travel history, either there is any recent drugs use, or either there is any change in any diet. So, of course, like all the things we inquire in the history. And in the physical examination, the most important thing is the clinical status of the dehydration or the hydration status of the patient. And, you know, like in diarrhea, again, we look for some red flags, and whenever they are present, you know, uh, they sh uh, to like point towards some sinister causes or like fatal causes. For example, if there is bloody... Uh, stool or bloody diarrhea uh, for example whenever there is any fever for example if it is accompanied by petechias or purpuras okay or um, for example if you found d high impression very 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 important or the child is presenting with weight loss which we also call as what failure to thrive right so of course like all these are red flags so um, for your memory I can make it red okay so these red flags of course will raise towards some um, causes which should be investigated 
properly and like investigations are needed for that and st things like this so um, now again guys um, like uh, like most of the investigations in diarrhea you know we go for chronic type of uh, diarrhea so first of all like I would show you for example like the first thing which I'm going to show you is the clinical uh, hydration status so um, we have talked about this thing in surgery as well but if you will see over here uh, see decreased level of consciousness, sunken fontanelle, dry mucous membranes, eye sunken and tearless, tachypnea, prolonged capillary filling time, tachycardia with weak peripheral pulses, reduced tissue, tissue trigger, sudden weight loss, reduced urinary output. That is the best thing, especially in infants, when you are checking the dehydration status. Okay, hydration status, cold extremities, hypotension, pale or mottled skin. So. Of course, whenever we see these signs in the babies, you know, we raise like the hydration status is not good. And, you know, as I told you, many people, many, many babies, they can die because of gastroenteritis, um, rotavirus, I told you, the most common viral cause or bacterial cause, whatever is there. Uh, so, guys, like, uh, uh, before going on to discuss about the investigations, uh, rather, I would like to tell you the causes of diarrhea. And once we will go through the causes, um, then we will talk about the investigations which can be done for diarrhea in the babies, right? Um, so to start our discussion, we are going to see the uh, a very good, you can say, uh, way to see what are the causes of diarrhea in the children. So you can see here they have given acute causes, chronic causes, right? So. Uh, you can see like acute causes they have divided into infectious and non-infectious whereas the chronic one and uh, now they divided into either it's with uh, with failure to thrive or either there is no failure to thrive right and then they talk about the age groups as well now i will tell you and with this one um, of course i will be talking about the investigations see for example if it's acute diarrhea and uh, it could be viral infections, it could be bacterial, it could be parasitic. So viral, see, the most common one is rotavirus or there could be other viruses. And then bacteria, Salmonella, Shigella, Campylobacter, E. coli, Yerysemia, Clostridium difficile, if there is any antibiotic use history. Or parasitic like Giardia, Lambly or Antibiba stomatica. In this one, like, of course, most of the books, they are written in developed world. So uh, what they say, like, if the child is having any... Uh, traveling history so always think about GIDL lamblia or antibiotic stilitica and most of the time you know it, it causes chronic infection chronic GIT infection so you will see that here they, uh, they, they are written over here as well as they should be written over here as well so GIT infections GIT infections GIT infections so bring this one down bring this one down bring this one down uh, one of the difference between these two is what like GIDL lamblia it never gives bloody diarrhea but antibiotic stilitica can give bloody diarrhea as well the non-infectious causes could be due to drugs like antibiotic induced, uh, non-specific associated with systemic infection, Hirschsprung disease, um, toxic ingestion or primary disaccharide deficiency. So whenever the, the patients will present with acute diarrhea, what investigations you can do? Uh, the most important one is stool culture and sensitivity to look for all these causes, right? So even like viruses. Um, for Clostridium difficile, you can check the stool for the toxin of Clostridium difficile. And in microscopy, maybe you can found the eggs of these things. So we can also go for uh, CBC, urine cultures and blood workup to look for, for example, associated with systemic infections, right? Whereas that if it's a chronic diarrhea, more than two weeks, so we see like either there is failure to thrive or weight decrease loss or there is no failure to thrive so whenever there is no failure to thrive so think about in zero to three months GIT infections in three months to three years think about GIT infections as well as toddlers diarrhea now what is toddlers diarrhea a very interesting type of condition toddlers diarrhea is the most common cause of chronic diarrhea in infancy okay so what I'm saying um, what I'm saying is 
few of the points I will be written over here, like I will write over here is toddler's diarrhea is the most common cause of chronic diarrhea in infancy, right? Um, now, the important thing is uh, here is like, you know, the onset is between 6 to 36 months of age, uh, but by 2 to 4 years of age, it is resolved. Now, guys, these are the kids which are thriving well. You will not found any history of failure to thrive or weight loss. And they have like around 4 to 6 bowel movements every day. Okay. And um, the important thing, when you will look in the history, you will found no other thing except you will found something in the diet like they will be having excess juice intake. Okay. Um, and when you will ask more about the history, you will ask like how their diet looks like. The parents will say that, you know, their stool have many undigested food particles. Okay. Now, uh, the important thing over here is what? This one is the diagnosis of exclusion. Okay. So when you have excluded all the other causes of diarrhea, and if you found like these two points on the history, so it could be um, toddler's diarrhea. And remember, there is no failure to thrive. Okay. There is no FTT. No failure to thrive. Very, very, very important thing. So how we manage this condition, you know, uh, we reassure the parents. We tell them that, you know, like uh, change their diet. That's very important. So to remember like the management of this thing, you know, a very important, a very uh, famous type of treatment, you can say, is called as four F's. Four F's, okay. For what is four F's? Four F, uh, F's is basically, uh, we give them um, fiber diet, okay. Uh, we give them fluid intake to normal limits, okay like because they are taking too much fluids so bring them in normal intake give them fat containing diet their diet should contain at least 40 percent of fats okay uh, up to uh, 40 percent of fats and the last f is fruit juice okay so discourage that okay discourage the fruit juice so this is like what is toddler's diarrhea and remember that there is no failure to thrive in these patients okay um, then you can see GIT infections and then you can find one more thing called as lactase deficiency now like guys if you know uh, we all have an enzyme called as lactase in our GIT and as we know that you know the milk contains lactose sugar so of course when the milk contains lactose sugar so what happens like um, the lactase enzyme is the one which break down that sugar okay so when someone have deficiency of lactase, what is going to happen that they have chronic diarrhea. What, of, what kind of chronic diarrhea? They have chronic watery diarrhea, sometimes with blotting and abdominal pain. And it is associated with what? It is associated with milk intake. Now the important thing is what? That uh, lactase deficiency can be a primary lactose deficiency or intolerance or secondary lactose intolerance okay primary lactose intolerance is basically common in East Asians and Africans okay and secondary lactose intolerance are basically present in older people okay this age group uh, see well, what happens is like most of the time you know they have some viral infection and after that viral infection what happens that they have they have what you can say decrease lactase levels or after bacterial infection or for example they are suffering from any malabsorptive condition like celiac disease or inflammatory bowel disease now in the history you will found a clear cut history of diarrhea with milk products intake so diagnosis can be done in simple way if you will remove lactose from their diet their diarrhea will be fixed when you will give them lactose they will be having diarrhea again okay uh, we can also do investigation for example we can do check the uh, ph of the stools the stool ph is more acidic and it is positive for the reducing sugars like the sugars which are not broken down they will have started appearing in the 
uh, stools. How we treat guys? Simply lactose free formulas are available for infants. Lactose free diet we can tell to the uh, adults. One of the thing you know, anyone who have lactose lactase deficiency or lactose intolerance, um, they can take soy based formulas or soy like you know in China if you will see that a lot of soy based drinks are available. So why? Because many people who have lactase deficiency they can consume that. Now this thing is there. Now for example someone will say no I cannot give up drinking milk I love it. So nowadays you know there are many drugs are available, capsule forms are available, um, drop forms are available, tablet forms are available of this enzyme lactase. So simply we can ask them if they want to take the dairy products like the milk product or the lactose containing products they can take the enzyme in tablet form or in the drop form simply like that is going to make up the deficiency of that lactase and uncommon causes could be chronic constipation uh, I will or discuss about this thing when we are going to discuss constipation UTI or drug induced now when the chronic diarrhea is associated with failure to thrive now guys see in very young babies there could be disaccharide days deficiency now disaccharide days deficiency simply as you know what is that that they cannot break down the sugars or the disaccharides okay so of course like the monosaccharides are the absorbable form cow milk protein allergy or cow milk protein intolerance and cystic fibrosis now cystic fibrosis as we know that it's an autosomal recessive type of condition in which there is a gene called as CFTR gene which is um, uh, what you can say uh, mutated and it's autosomal recessive type of condition very common like it is more common in white people and these are the babies who have more chloride in their sweat and we do sweat chloride test for them they have thick secretions they have thick G GID secretions they have thick pancreatic secretions they have thick respiratory secretions and their lifespan is short why because they have multiple respiratory tract infection they have multiple they have malabsorption in GID they get their pancreatic fluid can not come out they are uh, infertile in males okay so they have a lot of issues now cow milk protein allergy or intolerance or milk protein allergy simply now what is that one cow milk protein allergy cow milk protein allergy okay uh, now remember guys it's allergy and if you know allergies are basically IgE mediated things right so uh, now what are the presentation of these patients simply um, it is IgE mediated um, cow uh, uh, allergy right so uh, basically milk allergy is IgE mediated right milk allergy so um, one thing is what you can say cow milk protein allergy so basically what happened um, uh, this one um, cow milk protein allergy okay cow milk protein allergy is basically non IgE mediated IgE mediated okay cow milk protein allergy is uh, now non IgE mediated okay and this one is more common cow milk protein allergy is more common no, milk allergy is less common so cow milk protein allergy uh, what happens is like you know um, um, th this is something um, uh, what you can say it is a type of proctocolitis or inflammation of the pr uh, uh, the colon okay um, like it is associated with that like during infancy when the they are taking like the uh, food which uh, which uh, or the food proteins you know they cause proctocolitis right and due to that you know they have this one cow milk protein allergy so what happens um, basically um, uh, whatever allergy is there okay um, you know whenever like we have any allergy to anything how we present we have what you can say rashes okay and you know what we call that those rashes as we call it as urticaria okay 
hives, you know, hives on the skin become pruritic, pruritus is there, pruritus is there. So they present with this thing, as well as like, you know, they may have wheezing from the chest, they may have cough, okay, so all the rashes, you know, uh, all the allergies they present in this way, okay, they have these things. So what happened when someone have milk protein allergy, okay, milk allergy, what happens like they present in this way, but in cow milk protein allergy, which is a non IG mediated, so what happens? that uh, basically they develop something called as food protein induced proctocolitis of infancy. It is called as FPIPI. Okay, what it is? Food protein induced um, induced um, proctocolitis of infancy infancy okay so see it is called as FPIPI so what happens um, uh, what you can say like you know uh, in the infancy period um, due to the proteins they have proctocolitis pro proctocolitis okay uh, like they get inflammation of the uh, what you can say <laughs> colon um, as well as what happened, like sometimes they have enterocolitis. Enterocolitis is like inflammation of all the small and the large intestine. Or they may have enteropathy. Okay. So what happens is simply what is proctocolitis whenever they are present with this thing. Basically they have um, mild type of diarrhea with small amount of bloody stools in this case. And uh, if they have enterocolitis, you know. They have again like both things vomiting with diarrhea uh, with what you can say uh, blood in the stools and when they have enteropathy basically they have chronic diarrhea. Uh, of course like uh, remember guys see enteropathy means what like the now the intestines they are destroyed and simply they cannot absorb uh, or there is malabsorption. So basically due to malabsorption you will found one more thing called as hypoalbuminemia. Okay in these patients so uh, these three presentations can be there so this one is this one present with mild diarrhea and small amount of bloody stools and enterocolitis they present with vomiting diarrhea uh, with uh, anemia right so basically whenever we have to um, diagnose such conditions what we go, go is like we go for food challenge test okay and this is like how, how all the allergies they are identified so, uh, like we can go for skin prick testing or uh, you can measure the serum IgE levels right uh, in these patients. So simply um, anyone who have cow milk protein allergy uh, what we, we do is like uh, uh, whenever like in infancy you know you can say when they are around 6 to 8 months of age you know they had this thing they, they present in this way okay either of these things. So what happened like basically we stopped their uh, proteins okay um, so uh, then we reintroduced what you can say around six to eight months of age um, like uh, like after what you can say um, after some time okay we uh, we, st we stop uh, sorry it is like it starts from two to six months eight months of age right so what we do like uh, we stop their uh, milk and then we start the milk you know uh, you can say after um, some gap okay uh, now uh, <clears throat> and what we uh, basically give you know when we don't give them milk basically we give them because they have common protein allergy so we give them casein hydrosylate hydrolysate formula Okay. And now if you will go to the markets, you will found a very famous brand called as Nutramigen, you know, like this is a very famous brand like Nutramigen, uh, quite expensive, but like this is basically having casein hydroslysate formula. So uh, what is done like we put the babies on this formula, okay, to treat this condition. If the mother, if the baby is taking mother's diet, mother's milk, so we ask the mother to eliminate or to remove all the cow milk things in her diet okay 
So of course, like the mother can move on to the soy based um, formulas like or diet or um, soy proteins mothers can take. Okay, so uh, after that, like after some gap, we can start the um, breast milk or the normal milk. Okay, after some delay. So like of course, we have to we wait like for this condition to be uh, to what you can say resolve and then we start again so that is like basically about cow milk protein allergy uh, one thing is called a celiac disease now a celiac disease is quite common um, disease you can say uh, which is present again in what you can say uh, <laughs> in people and what happens is uh, again celiac disease is a type of enteropathy uh, in which they cannot or they are hypersensitive to gluten okay they are hypersensitive to what they are hypersensitive to gluten so again like it's a, a condition in which like a immunological condition what happens is when these patients you know they uh, they consume the gluten containing diet okay so what happens like uh, the uh, auto antibodies you know um, they uh, causes enteropathy or they damage the intestine and they have like they develop malabsorption now a very easy way to remember you know like gluten containing dry diets so what are the gluten containing diets guys it can be remembered by the term called as bro okay bro bro i have what so you can say um celiac patients celiac disease patients should avoid um, bro diets okay should avoid bro diets so what is bro um, b r o w so what is bro b is for barley okay r is for rye o is for oats okay and uh, w is for wheat okay so they must not take this thing because all these things they can contain gluten okay so whenever they take a uh, gluten containing diet uh, what happens like uh, um, they have they develop a malabsorption syndrome syndrome simply because uh, uh, what happens is uh, uh, <laughs> what you can say um, there is an immunological response against that gluten okay and like they destroy that immunological response they destroy the um, you know the enterocytes or you can say the cells of the uh, the lining of the intestines or you can say uh, the villi you know villi the villi so basically the villi are they are lined by um, <clears throat> the villi they are lined by enterocytes okay so they basically destroy this thing and whenever they, when they destroy this thing of course they develop a malabsorptive type of uh, syndrome uh, so, so like there is malabsorption so simply guys whenever like the they have celiac disease what happens is um, uh, you know like uh, until six months of age the babies they are dependent on milk okay so you will not found any celiac disease in that in that age but once you will start them weaning off and we will start introducing other diets or the wheat containing diets what will happen that they present with failure to thrive okay and that's why you know this one is written in failure to thrive and they present with uh, failure to thrive abdominal distension um, lethargy um, muscle weakness you know, irritability okay and uh, of course like if we can diagnose it at early stage we will omit the bro diet and of course they they become better if you're not going to diagnose that thing so what will happen um, they will develop, develop malabsorptive state and they can develop any type of malabsorption like iron deficiency anemia they can develop okay so um, they can develop all these things so now uh, they like remember you know it runs in families and that's why we whenever we take history we ask the family that if anyone in the family is on special diet okay so okay. when you will go to the uh, supermarket you will see like they give the allergy information like so anyone who is or like they give for example the things like gluten-free diets okay so uh, now uh, uh, this is like how they present okay um, uh, one of the thing guys uh, to remember about this one um, other than this one okay so when due to malabsorption they develop iron deficiency anemia uh, they develop uh, rickets uh, we already discussed rickets you know their uh, butts become flat 
they have nausea vomiting they may develop edema they may they may develop abdominal pain uh, and uh, one of the thing you know which is very much uh, you can say a very famous type of question which they ask is uh, something called as dermatitis um, herpetiformis okay so this one this is a rash which looks like this okay this is dermatitis herp herpetiformis you can see over here okay so um, I will I will show you for example um, in baby especially okay um, wait um, pediatrics so so you can see like you know um, dermatitis or platyformis see this one so uh, this is a rash you know which can they which is associated with celiac disease so dermatitis or platyformis is one of the thing uh, they present with uh, their teeth enamel is um, hypoplastic okay so uh, celiac disease you know it present in this way and they have you know short stature uh, see what are the symptoms of um, celiac disease you can see over here um, a lot of symptoms are written over here okay intestinal symptoms um, female specific oral symptoms behavioral symptoms so a lot of symptoms you know they like they, they are caused by um, celiac disease uh, <clears throat> now guys you know whenever anyone have celiac disease um, what happens is uh, um, okay not just this like you know they have short stature they have delayed puberty uh, they have behavioral changes and things like this and remember it's an autoimmune type of disorder so whenever like anyone has to have one autoimmune disorder so of course uh, they may have other autoimmune dis disorders as well like diabetes or um, myasthenia gravis or autoimmune hepatitis things like this so uh, remember like whenever anyone have one hepa, uh, autoimmune disease we uh, look for any other autoimmune disease now see how, what happens like if you get a patient a baby of which have failure to thrive and uh, on the history you found like before he was fine or his birth growth chart was going fine but um, once they started uh, introducing a, or winning off or introducing new diets you know the baby have diarrhea and uh, due to that diarrhea now now you know there is failure to thrive so always think about celiac disease and basically uh, we go for screening test okay in these babies and what screening test basically we check for IgA um, tissue trans um, glutaminase uh, uh, antibodies okay remember it's a autoimmune condition and also um, endo mycel antibodies okay so these are the antibodies we check uh, in these patients okay so of course like these are these are the diagnostic test, uh, screening test okay and the diagnostic test of course the diagnosis will be done on biopsy uh, when you will take a biopsy from uh, the intestine and you will found like the enterocytes are destroyed the villus are destroyed okay so we can take the biopsy and on biopsy we are going to see um, that there is villus atrophy the villi they are already atrophic okay and the crypts uh, are basically hypertrophy so there is crypt hypertrophy as well as villus are atrophic okay or hypertrophic so uh, this one like is a diagnostic test so we will take the small intestine biopsy okay so uh, this is like how we uh, do and simply the management I told you the management is like uh, ask them to not take any uh, things like this. So oats are basically controversial because many many books says that you know oats can should also be avoided but many books says just these three things are avoided. So oats remember are controversial and of course like there are dietitian you know which plan the diet for them okay. Uh, for these patients okay so of course like if it is diagnosed uh, in the start so the things are what you can say um, better uh, so uh, celiac disease is also called as a gluten sensitive enteropathy okay gluten sensitive enteropathy so uh, of course gluten free diet for lifelong is the only thing we can do in these patients Okay, so that is about uh, you can say the celiac disease and uh, other thing. Um, again, we'll go there. Okay, inflammatory bowel diseases. Now, see, guys, inflammatory bowel diseases. I will not go in too much detail. Why? 
because uh, you are going to study them in internal medicine anyways right so inflammatory bowel diseases so ibds uh, guys uh, remember ibds two main kind of ibds which are there one is what crohn's disease okay and one is called as what um, ulcerative colitis okay ulcerative colitis so now um, <laughs> now this inflammatory bowel disease you know guys you know uh, this is the type of diseases in which like nowadays their incidence is increasing okay and more and more people are uh, diagnosed and to tell you basically the incidence has increased in the last three decades uh, now um, there are a few differences for example the Crohn's disease you know uh, or Crohn disease it can affect any area of the GIT starting from the mouth till the anus and ulcerative colitis it affect the large intestine only um, now uh, both of them they give systemic features as well uh, what's going on remember there's inflammation going on in the bowel okay and now whenever like these patients they have like either Crohn disease or, or ulcerative colitis uh, we see like you know either it's involving all the GIT or just the colon either they have more bloody diarrhea which is a feature of ulcerative colitis or they have Crohn disease so they clinically or uh, these things are important uh, but of course like the diagnostics they need a lot of other things so basically anyone who have um, IBDs you know uh, they have what you can say FTT failure to thrive they present with abdominal pain they present with diarrhea they can may have fever they uh, may have uh, extra intestinal manifestations um, extra intestinal manifestations you know could be anything like uh, uveitis or arthralgias erythema nodosum and oral lesions uh, so uh, basically you know if you will uh, see for example um, difference between um, what you can say um, Crohn disease and ulcerative colitis um, you will found a lot of areas you know um, see um, uh, okay a very nice diagram I think is this one uh, wait. Uh, wait 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 um, you can see like a very nice diagram is this one um, Ulcerative colitis affect the entire large colon and the Crohn disease can affect any part of the digestive tract from mouth to anus. So uh, this thing, okay. Um, other than this, um, I will show you a lot of other features. For example, um, wait, I'm finding a better one. Um, yeah, maybe this one. Okay yes see this one uh, basically ulcerative colitis it mostly affect the rectum and Crohn disease it mostly affect the terminal ileum Crohn disease mouth to anus this one mostly mostly rectum Crohn disease ulcerative colitis give a continuous lesion whereas Crohn disease you know it have a patchy type of lesion so it is not like so you can say the lesions are discontinued right and uh, in, in here what they found is extensive ulceration with pseudopolyps and in this one they found apoptosis ulcer in the mouth they found linear fissures they found cobblestoning appearance they found thickened bowel wall they found creeping fat and in this one like they have non caseating granulomas on microscopy they have crypt abscesses inflammation you know this is a very important point so they like ulcer Crohn disease it causes transmural inflammation like the all the thickness of the intestine whereas in ulcerative colitis it is just related to uh, limited to the mucosa and submucosa it's not a transmural type of inflammation so the complications it can cause toxic megacolon whereas this one because it gives transmural inflammation it can cause strictures string sign or uh, which we can see on the barium studies okay um, extra intestinal manifestations are more common in ulcerative colitis and uncommon in Crohn disease okay and the cancer risk is very common in ulcerative colitis but less common in Crohn disease so these are the few of the differences which we can see in these patients okay and what are these you know the crypt abscesses and all this stuff um, you can see over here so ulcerative colitis see they can have pseudopolyps right and 
um, in this one um, they have transmural inflammation so see all the uh, length of the intestines they are involved and see they have structure formation see they are showing you structures and they have in this one see the continuation of the, the thing is there but in this one they have skip lesions uh, what a skip lesion is simply um, like one part of the intestine is normal and then there is some part of the intestine which have like this you know so this one there is lesion and then there is no lesion and then there is lesion like this way so anyhow uh, like this one is like uh, the differences between uh, Crohn disease and uh, ulcerative colitis and the diagnosis is basically endoscopic or like we can take the biopsy and we examine them uh, and we then we make a diagnosis so guys you know like whatever is the condition you will study the condition like how they treat of course it's a condition uh, in which we like we use uh, inflammation is going on so we use anti-inflammatory treatment we use corticosteroids we use immunosuppressants like uh, azathioprine and things like this okay so all these things can be used uh, other than that um, there could be diarrhea due to endocrinal causes like thyrotoxicosis neoplastic causes like fucromocytoma and these are the uncommon causes like short bowel syndrome or uh, Swatchman diamond syndrome so anyhow like these are not so common causes so we are not going to discuss in detail uh, for these patients um, the last topic uh, for today is called as constipation um, constipation now uh, constipation is uh, a very common thing guys as you know and the, when diarrhea is the increased frequency so constipation is simply um, decreased frequency okay decreased um, frequency uh, of stools uh, okay uh, um, or you can say like uh, less than three uh, stools per week okay less than three stools per week um, so uh, and of course like the stools become hard uh, because they stay inside more so more and more water is absorbed in them okay uh, now guys you know in constipation the most interesting thing is 99% of the times it is functional constipation okay functional constipation uh, what is functional constipation now 99% uh, of the times you know the constipation is functional functional I told you constipation is very 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 common right so and most of the cases of constipation basically they are functional constipation in pediatrics uh, now um, whenever it is functional constipation uh, well, like we diagnose functional constipation on a criteria which is called as Rome 3 criteria Rome 3 criteria so uh, a Rome 3 criteria I will show you um, it's a very easy type of criteria um, by the way you don't have to remember that okay uh, <coughs> now uh, what is the Rome 3 criteria I will show you yes this one uh, we can open any one but okay we will open uh, this one now what is Rome 3 criteria um, it is a diagnostic criteria for Oh, sorry this one is you know it's not fitting in my screen so I would rather change it um, to other one uh, I don't know like what's wrong with my PC uh, you can say yes this one so uh, see um, Rome 3 criteria is a very very simple criteria and uh, you can see like this one is for new nets and toddlers and this one is for uh, children and adolescents so we'll go like we'll read this one so must include two or more of the following in a child with developmental age of at least four years with insufficient criteria for diagnosis of irritable bowel syndrome so two or more two or or fewer defecations in the toilet per week okay at least one episode of fecal incontinence per week or history of retentive posturing you know like when the child uh, they, they they are stopping their bowel movement so they have they they acquire some typical posture so that is called as retentive posturing 
history of painful or hard bowel movements large fecal mass in the rectum on examination of course and history of large diameter stools that may obstruct the toilet so this is the rome 3 criteria and this is the rome 3 criteria for infants and toddlers so anyone who fulfill this criteria we call that the patient have functional constipation right now what's the reason of this functional constipation guys what they found like you know it is like mostly due to lack of fiber diet or change in diet very very common in infants you know whenever you will change their milk they get constipation okay whenever you will change their diet they will get constipation whenever you will shift them from mother milk to cow milk they 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 have uh, they they can have constipation uh, like of course like uh, uh, there is more solute content you know in the cow milk and low water content in the cow milk so that's one of the reason you know they get constipation so um, in toddlers especially uh, you know bad toilet training practices can lead to uh, constipation and after when they develop constipation you know when we they go for what you can say uh, toilets you know they feel pain on defecation so uh, then they prefer to uh, withhold their stools okay so uh, remember there are two very crucial times you know when they can develop constipation one is like the toilet training time and the other one is when they are starting the school so uh, how we uh, what you can say uh, uh, manage the you know, what you can say uh, this uh, functional type of constipation uh, in the baby so first of all you know um, we look for all the other causes you know which can cause constipation for example in this one of course we look for the red flags like if there should be no failure to thrive there should be no what you can say bloody stools if there is bloody stool and they are due to anal fissure that that's a different thing uh, there should be no failure to thrive and uh, uh, all these things right so uh, we rule out hypothyroidism for example we rule out hypercalcemia on investigations things like this we ask about their diet how what is their dietary habits how much m uh, fluid intake they have and of course like examination we palpate their abdomen we see if there we can found any masses in the tummy okay uh, uh, of the baby so um, um, now um, most of the constipations by the way if they are like arising like it's a new problem like they resolve on itself okay but any long-standing constipation of course we have to manage that why because if we will not manage that you know um, the due to retentive or like when the fecal matter will be inside for a long period of time you know um, basically what happened is like uh, uh, their rectum become bigger in size so they can accommodate more stool okay and sometime it can lead to um, overflow incontinence so what happened like maybe if i if i can found anything like this so i can show you over here um, you can say uh, fecal overflow <coughs> incontinence okay um, continence so um, by the way i never found a nice diagram for this one um, <clears throat> for example yes this one so what happened like you know when they have a, too much hard stools over here so they are blocking the way so when the soft stools are over there and you know the capacity of this one is uh, reached like it cannot withhold so like some amount of this can escape from here and causes incontinence so of course like it will soil their pants okay so this is one of the history points you know which we can see and this is called as you know retentive uh, type of what you can say um, incontinence now of course like it's very um, the child they really feel bad when they soil their pants okay and involuntary soiling soiling their pants and if they are in school so of course like um, they they can be bullied okay because of this thing uh, and of course like whenever we had such such patient you know our initial uh, what you can say target is to evacuate or like remove or get rid of this stool mass okay and after uh, getting rid of this stool mass of course like your next target should be what uh, you should not allow this mass to collect again so uh, what we do they do like basically they start with some stool softeners initially and for that you know they give some um, what you can say medications um, for example um, what they can give is something called as peg 3350 flakes okay 
there are other things they can do uh, they can give as well um, for example you can give them um, laxatives like uh, um, you can say it's also laxative by the way uh, like uh, um, movicol or you can say polyethylene um, glycol okay so this thing you can give and of course like uh, um, what happens um, if like this is going to soften and the stool are going to uh, run out after softening that's good if it is not coming out then you can provide some stimulant laxative okay so uh, stimulant leg laxatives you know for example you can give them cena okay or something called as pod uh, sodium picosulfate or sodium uh, picosulfate can be given okay to these babies um, now you know like uh, once uh, what you can say uh, once you have removed this mass okay so now uh, guys the important thing is what to to make it like this like you know so what we do like once we remove that thing we basically um, um, educate the parents especially uh, to maintain this thing that no more fecal matter should be collected over here so give them adequate fluids like every day give them enough dietary fibers like fruits vegetables whole grains and keep on giving them stool softening medications for some time and now what we ask them is to toilet train them what is the best way to toilet train is simply right after diet right after meal they can take them to the toilets let them to sit for three to ten minutes and let them to defecate so if they are doing like one to two defecations every day that's a very good thing and you know like the treatment is not so easy because the treatment is very very long lasting sometimes it takes like up to six months for this maintenance therapy okay until they develop a regular bowel movement and they can go to the toilets without any difficulty without any pain and of course like a lot of encouragement is needed for the parents for the babies okay so you remember guys you know whenever they have a hard stool and whenever they pass a hard stool basically they feel pain they may develop anal fissures and with due to that pain they can uh, they will hold the stools inside and this is a vicious type of circle because when they hold the stool uh, you know this area keep on becoming bigger or there is dilatation and they develop overflow incontinence right so these are the things so uh, always rule out the organic causes of uh, constipation which i told you can be hypothyroidism can be hypercalcemia can be a trauma to the spinal cord can be some bowel obstruction can be drugs like opioids can cause uh, like chemotherapeutic drugs can cause okay and uh, the last thing which we are going to discuss today is co something called as um his sprung disease uh, okay and now to show you what is his sprung disease is basically um sprung disease okay uh, now um, uh, basically they have no ganglions okay uh, yes this one now um, what happens see this is the normal colon right see the continuity of the colon everything is fine okay now if this part of the colon is basically a ganglionic like there is no ganglion there is um, no ganglion cells means what like the absence of ganglion soil cells from the plexus you know like these bowel movements you know these uh, intestines they are always in the movement so see this area is a ganglionic so what will happen there is no peristalsis over here so when there is no peristalsis you know there will be no movements over here so it is like it will cause a type of obstruction and see there's a dilatation over here so this is basically what happens in hirsprung disease and now uh, what happens in hirsprung disease like because they have uh, um, a ganglionic or ga like the absence of ganglions are there 
so what happens is like there is a narrowed segment okay and uh, uh, most of the time this abnormal bowel extend from the rectum to variable distance okay some have a short segment some will have bigger segment now uh, uh, most of the lesions are in the same region like rectosigmoid which I show you when they are born basically they don't pass the first stool or there is failure to pass the meconium in the first 24 hour life and they present with bile stale vomiting they present with abdominal distension and things like this so of course we go for investigations and when we go for investigations what happens is we run we give uh, them what you can say um, uh, this one you know barium studies can be done so, so you see you can see the normal colon and then there is a contracted colon right so that okay and we can you can also take a biopsy of course like the diagnosis will be done on the biopsy and in the biopsy what they will found you will found like there is a a ganglionic uh, so this is the barium studies but the diagnosis will be done on biopsy because uh, in this one you will found like there is a part of the segment of the intestines sorry the colon where, where there is no um, ganglionic cells right so there will be no movement so simply um, now guys like we know uh, what is the treatment of this thing okay so uh, like just not to leave the slide empty I can write like there will be absence of ganglionic cells or ganglion cells okay ganglion cells uh, from the myenteric plexus or um, from the myenteric you know in the muscles and you can say submucosal um, plexus okay and which one in the of the large intestine of the large bowel okay so this is like the definition and I told you 75% of the, of the uh, are in retrosigmoid so how the patient present bilious vomiting okay um, abdominal um, distension uh, and failure to pass meconium um, in first 24 hours of life okay hours of life and of course like it's an emergency it's a obstruction we go for um, barium studies we can do barium studies uh, you can do biopsy to make the diagnosis and what is the management guys remember surgical of course like there is surgical so they have to remove that part and uh, um, what you can say they have to uh, what you can say do anastomosis with the normal colon of course like the uh, so the management is always surgical so that's all for today guys i hope you understand so see you guys in the next lecture okay and uh, i wish like you guys are going to go through all these topics from any textbook and if you don't understand anything you can ask me questions and i would love to answer them so take care see you